Hi, everyone. My name is Rishi. I'm one of the engineering directors uh, in the Android and, um, and the Play teams. Uh, I honestly feel like I lucked into one of the coolest jobs at Google. Um, there's a lot of activity going on in the space. Uh, I promised myself a beer every time someone mentioned AI or machine learning. Uh, and it seems like at the end of the day, I'm going to be very, very drunk at the rate that things, uh, things are going today. So <clears throat> it's no secret that if you've been following our narrative in the last couple of IOs, a few hardware announcements, that Google's um, heavily banking on AI and machine learning is one of the core pillars of our product development. Uh, and, and, and there is a reason for that. You have heard our CEO mention before that we used to be a mobile-first company, uh, and now we are an AI-first company. And I wanted to give you some context into how we evolved into that vision. So come to think about it, uh, in retrospect, it is easy to, to imagine what it meant to be a mobile-first product. A mobile-first product that is, uh, is a product that is fundamentally designed for a small screen. It is fundamentally designed for a, uh, for a product that has always-on connectivity. It is fundamentally designed for low-power usage, uh, and so on and so forth. So we believe that products of tomorrow will uh, we'll take some of these other things for granted. So products of today, for example, it's hard to imagine uh, an app that is not designed uh, with some of the principles I mentioned in the mobile first column. Five years down, I think products of tomorrow will have to have some of these other columns, uh, uh, other factors in the AI first column. So products of tomorrow, we believe, will be required to learn and adapt, will be expected to learn and adapt from, from user behavior. We believe the products of tomorrow should assist the user uh, in get, doing their uh, uh, you know, day better. We believe that products of tomorrow should be conversational and assistant. Uh, so products of tomorrow should be able to figure out if they don't know anything, and they should be able to ask the user for the right information. Products of tomorrow should also be context aware. They should be aware of the state of the environment. They should be aware of the state of the user. And they should be using that information to make that product better. And last but not the least, products of tomorrow should be trustworthy in a fundamental way. And that's not just about safety, security, and privacy, but also being able to deliver performance that is reliable on day one and on day 100. So with that in mind, machine learning is a fundamental set of algorithms that help our products and our platforms uh, get closer to that vision. Um, I say here on this slide that machine learning is the science and the art of making machines learn. Your product shouldn't just be great on day one, but should be even better on day 100. And machine learning will help you get there. So as a running example, I picked, a, a, picked an app, that, a hypothetical app, that will uh, take a picture uh, of an animal and let you classify it as a, as a, da a dog or a cat. And in, in the world of yesterday, you would develop this system by designing a bunch of heuristics based on human knowledge of what separates a dog and a cat. And you would just encode that knowledge in a bunch of rules. But real world is much messier than that and very unpredictable. So your set of rules might work for 10 images, 20 images, 100 images. But as, I, as you start to gather hundreds of thousands of images, all kinds of corner cases pile up. And it becomes really hard and intractable for a rule-based system to evolve. So before I take this, took this new gig on, I ran search and discovery for the Play Store for four years. And even our app store stack started uh, with a rule-based way. And as our product started to grow, uh, it became harder and harder to evolve it over time. And so machine learning comes to the rescue. So compared to rule-based systems, machine learning systems take a completely different approach to solving some of the same problems. So here I show a simple schematic of something called a neural network. It's called a neural network because it mimics the processing of our brain uh, and, and try to achieve it with software systems. So the way this works is given a picture uh, and given millions of such pictures, it will take the pixels of that picture and then follow through with layers of computation, computation to allow us to predict at the end whether it was a cat or a dog. 
It doesn't start with hard-coded set of rules that embed our knowledge about cats and dogs. Instead, it learns or relies on millions of samples and data. And with every sample, it gets better and better and better at doing, doing that job. So back in 2001, uh, 2011, uh, on some of the standard data sets around computer vision, around recognizing objects in images, we had around 26% error rate. Compare that to error rate with humans, about 5%. So you could imagine that at that time, we would be lucky if we could classify a picture as indoor versus outdoor, but we weren't too good at reliably recognizing what's in the picture. So today, these systems based on deep neural networks are even better than human-level performance. It's a 3% error rate, and perceptually it feels like we are now able to see the world through machines, and that enables a whole lot of other things, other cool things we could do uh, with software systems. And it's not just about labeling pictures as a cat or a dog, but we can automatically caption them with really human-sounding captions. So I sh show some of the examples here. The left-hand side top picture says, a close-up of a child holding a stuffed animal. So if you think about it, uh, there are many primitives that goes into a label like that. We not only detect that there is a, a young child uh, and a stuffed animal in the picture, we detect that the child is holding the, the, the animal and that it's a close-up. So there are multiple layers of intelligence built into uh, a caption like that. There are many you know, cool examples here that really showcase how the technology has evolved over time. Um, the scientist in me would cringe if I hadn't put uh, even a single example of a mislabel. You can see that the bottom row says, a man flying through the air riding a snowboard, and it's clearly not that. So AI systems today are much better where, compared to where they used to be, but they're still not perfect. And any product you design with AI in mind has to be aware of that. So the types of problems ML can solve, like I want to give you a quick flavor for the types of use cases you might be able to power with ML and AI. So the first example is classification, and it's similar to what I showed before. Take a picture, label it as a cat or a dog. Take a song, label it as a pop song or a rock song. Uh, or take an app and label it as a harmful app or not. And these are some of the examples of, um, of classification. Take an item and label it. Uh, within the namespace. Another example is prediction. So here I show uh, YouTube uh, next uh, recommendations for videos to watch if you have watched this video. So machine learning systems are getting really, really better at predicting user activity. If you watch this video, given the knowledge of other users who have watched the same video before, are you able to reliably predict which, app they're gonna, which video they're going to use next? And the third example, uh, sorry, where do I go back? Yeah, is, is perception. So machine learning systems are getting better at not just labeling and predicting, but also being able to understand the world through images, through sound, through audio, and through natural language processing. Here I, sh uh, I show an example of assistant integration, and I know you'll be hearing about that through the day. So a few examples of where Google's used ML technology over the few years. So Google has a wide array of products. Some of these products, seven uh, products, are used by billion plus monthly active users a day. And many of them fundamentally use machine learning. An example here is Google Lens. Uh, this is one of the, you know, the recent examples of machine learning has fundamentally changed the way products uh, behave today. So you are able to not only detect landmarks, but are able to do that in real time in the viewfinder of the camera uh, and, and perceive uh, the real-time imagery through machines. Next example is machine learned personalized recommendations. Kobe mentioned uh, that ML is used heavily for recommendations on the App Store. Here I show example from YouTube. Uh, so given your video watch history, what uh, videos make the most sense for you? Another example is Google Translate, uh, where you can look at the picture in real time, detect not only the text in the picture, detect the language it's in, and able to recognize that all in real time. Another example is Smart Reply in Gmail and Inbox. 
we can process the text of the message and are able to predict what the likely response is going to be. So, so for someone like me, running from meeting to meeting, trying to respond to image, sorry, messages um, on the staircase, this sort of feature is super useful. And last not, but not the least, this is an example where it's not a user-facing application at all, but uh, our ability to, uh, to uh, optimize uh, back-end processing in data centers. So using DeepMind AI from our office in London, we are able to reduce our power usage in Google's data centers by up to 40%. So um, Google not only builds some of these products, but we also have some of the most used platforms uh, in the world today. And it's not sufficient for our own products to get better with AI and ML. We also want to empower all of you to use AI and ML in your own products as well. So to do that, uh, we open source some of the fundamental parts of our ML stack through TensorFlow uh, a couple of years ago. And this is a repository in GitHub that any one of you can you know, download and use. It's getting huge traction in the developer community already. Just in two years, this graph shows the GitHub stars for TensorFlow compared to other such repositories out there. And it has just you know, ex you know, been exceedingly popular uh, and getting used more and more. We are not going to stop there, though. So TensorFlow, uh, when it was open sourced a couple of years ago, it was fundamentally designed for server use case. And at I.O. this year, we announced that we are taking it to work on device. So TensorFlow Lite, which is going to be a fast and efficient version of TensorFlow, going to be open sourced uh, this quarter, uh, will be instance of TensorFlow that runs on Android devices. And last but not the least, we are not only making it possible for you to, uh, you to use ML libraries, but we are also making it possible for you to directly access Google's intelligent APIs. So example here is detecting faces and emotions in faces through Google's Cloud ML APIs, and some of the same APIs are available on a device as well. So that's it. I'll be available for taking some of the questions later down the day, and I know we have a, a deeper dive on ML during the day. Thank you all.